What's that? Okay. All right, thanks, Titus. Uh, could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1? Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to be noting Daniel 1, 3 this evening. And in this passage, we're going to see that Nebuchadnezzar commands Ashpenaz, his, his chief official, to choose certain Israelites of royal and noble descent for governmental service. And uh, this was something that a lot of the kings in the ancient world since the time of Alex, uh, all the way up to uh, Alexander the Great was known for doing this. But he would, uh, conquering rulers would oftentimes try to get the, br the best and the brightest from each nation to serve in their government. And this is what we'll see here this evening. And uh, also we're going to find out, uh, see another passage in, in uh, second, I think it's in Second Kings, where there's a uh, fulfilled prophecy uh, that uh, related to uh, Judah being, or Israel being taken into captivity uh, into Babylon. So we're going to see a passage, a couple of pass one passage, and there's another passage in Isaiah that that speaks of this uh, prophecy in relation to King Hezekiah. But that'll be our subject here uh, this evening. So without further, remember we don't have a Bible class tomorrow evening. We'll resume classes on Sunday morning. We'll be doing, of course, on Sundays, the book of Exodus. So we'll be continuing that. So without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear the, what the Spirit's going to say to us through the teaching of the Word of God. And in order to uh, have that take place, for us to listen to the Spirit as believers, we need to be in fellowship with God, filled with the Spirit, uh, filled with, being filled with the Spirit and being in fellowship with God. You can't be one without the other. Both uh, fellowship is... Uh, when you're in fellowship, you're filled with the Spirit, and when you're filled with the Spirit, you're in fellowship with God. So uh, we, this is a very important time. So in order to be filled with the Spirit and, and, and also, of course, uh, in fellowship with God, we need to confess our sins if necessary. Do it. First John 1 John 1.9 states, If we confess our sins to the Father, He, God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing, even the sins that we don't know that we're committing due to ignorance of the Word of God. And... Uh, you might say, uh, a lot of, I've heard there's a lot of false teaching out there saying, you know, Paul never taught the confession of sin. Well, he did talk about judging the body rightly uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is Paul's language for confession of sin. And also when he talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new, that obviously implies uh, the confession of sin. So just because Paul doesn't use the language of John and explicitly a lot of believers are mechanical in their thinking like that. Paul and his readers would know what he was talking about, that he couldn't have fellowship uh, without uh, confession of sin. That was just a given. And uh, because it was taught in the Old Testament in Psalm 32, with King David talked about that confession of sin. And uh, if you don't confess your sins, some people say, well, if Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I believe in Jesus as my Savior, why do I have to confess my sins? Well, fellowship. And uh, remember, fellowship... Is a, is a dynamic, it can be lost due to sin, and uh, also uh, our eternal relationship with God, that of course never changes when we believe in Jesus as our Savior, we're entered into the royal family of God, we're members of the body of Christ, but that, and that never changes due to sin, just like, just because I sinned against my parents, disobeyed them, they didn't disown me, I no longer, I wasn't uh, immediately cast out of the Wenstrom family, I was still in the family, I was just out of fellowship with them because of disobedience, so... Uh, this will be. Uh, 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 this is the same principle. It's in God's family as well. What do you need? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, is it really? No. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, you can take care of that, Tyler. So, uh, uh, if you once you've confessed your sin, you uh, stay in fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. And uh, if there's anything that's disturbing and distracting to you, do it. First Peter five seven says, "Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord, because He cares for you." What are you doing down there, you? <laughs> you look like he's on D-Day there, crawling on the beaches. <laughs> Thanks for doing that, kid. It's saying waiting for programs to shut down. That's all right. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so that was tapping the uh, internet thing, huh? Yeah, I was downloading stuff. Really. All right, good, good catch there. All right, uh, let's uh, take that moment of silent prayer. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Father, we thank you for this great and awesome privilege that you've given us to learn about your character and nature and your will for our lives through the study of the Word. We thank you, Father, for the gift of the Spirit, the completed canon of Scripture, the Bible, and we just thank you for this uh, wonderful treasure that you've given us to give us insight into your character and nature, your will for our lives, what you've done for us through both your Son and the Spirit. And it's just awesome that we can go and uh, look at the Bible and get. we have all these books here. A complete re- revelation to mankind. And uh, we know that in previous dispensations in the Old Testament, Moses only had, of course, uh, very few books. You know, he was given those, the, the law. But uh, we have all, uh, both the New Testament and the Old Testament. And, it, and, and we also know, Father, that in the first century, was, while it was being written, they just couldn't turn like, like we can today. So to the different books like Revelation and Ephesians. So we were truly blessed, Father. And we just thank you, Father, not only for the men and women that you raised up throughout the century so that were faithful to you and did your will in relation to the completed canon of Scripture. We thank you for them and the scholars and different men throughout history that you have served you and have been dedicated to the teaching of the Word of God. Father, we just thank you for all the things that we've been learning in, in the Word of God and now we're starting to learn with Daniel how to live a godly lives in the midst of a great apostasy, maybe even among our own brethren, but also in the midst of a world that is deceived by the devil and driven by the sin nature. And we just thank you, Father, for giving us encouragement in your word as to how we should conduct ourselves so that we might uh, become uh, members of your hall of fame of faith, following the line of men like Noah and Daniel and Moses, who uh, went against the grain, did not run with the crowd, did not follow the herd, but actually uh, stood in the gap, and, uh, and guys like uh, men like Jeremiah, people who stood in the gap, who did not, uh, uh, were not conformed to this world system, but operated in faith and trusted your word, Father. So help us to be like them. Help us to become more dedicated and devoted to you and be more obedient to you. Uh, we just pr- uh, lift up uh, our, our ministry, and we just pray, Father. Uh, for uh, the people down in Alabama, we thank you for the people here in Iowa and other people who are the people who are following faithfully on Pal Talk. Uh, and we just pray also for the people who are hitting our website and, and v- downloading the teaching. And uh, we just thank you for each and every one of them. We pray that you would, uh, we thank you for the people you've raised up that have been uh, faithful in praying to the, for this ministry and giving to this ministry and serving this in this ministry and we just pray father that you would uh, continue to provide for our needs so that we can continue to to get the word of god out and we just uh, thank you for the thompsons opening up their home and we just uh, pray that uh, give titus the wisdom he needs with the sound and the recordings and we just thank you for his service in that area and we just thank you for the audience we just pray those in the audience would have uh, objectivity that everyone would concentrate that the Spirit would help us all to concentrate in the audience and that the, the audience might uh, carefully consider what's being taught and make application in their own lives. And uh, also we pray, Father, that you would give grace to myself so that I could deliver you to your people, your full counsel, with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power, so that the body of Christ would be built up and edified spiritually and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified to the maximum. So, Father, we just uh, pray for these things in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 is where you should be. We're going to note Daniel 1, 3 this evening, as I noted a few moments ago before the silent prayer. We have in this verse the record of Nebuchadnezzar commanding his chief official, Ashpenaz, to select certain Israelites of royal and noble descent in order to serve in his government. Look at Daniel 1.1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, a king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, the Solomon's temple. And he brought them to the land of Shinar. Uh, That, of course, is the Babylon. To the house of his God, which was Marduk, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Remember, we saw last evening uh, that in the ancient world would be considered a god, a victory for the god of Bab- uh, Marduk, who is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's god. That uh, vi- Nebuchadnezzar's victory would be considered in the ancient world a victory of his god over the god of the, uh, the uh, those in Judah and Israel. And so, of course, that is a deception. Of course, God, the God of the Israelites, who is the God of who created everything and redeemed us 
Jesus Christ, he has given Jehoiakim and the Israelites and Judah, in the northern and southern kingdom, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was actually serving God's purposes uh, by administering, being human instrument, human instrument that God used to uh, uh, discipline uh, the Israelites and to, uh, to both the northern and the southern kingdom. So uh, this is what we have there in verse 2. Now look at verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths, or as we'll say, young men, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. That's another expression, for, another name for the Babylonians. Now in verse 3, the phrase, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his, of his officials. That phrase is composed of the conjunction wa, translated uh, actually then. And then we have the verb in the cal imperfect form, amar, which is translated here, ordered correctly. Then we have the articular form of the noun malek, which is translated correctly king. It's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. And then we have a prepositional phrase, which begins with a preposition lamed, translated of, and its object is the proper noun ashpanaz. And this is followed by an, another noun. We have the word rab, translated here chief. And then we have a, a, a construct form of the noun saris, which is actually translated here correctly, officials. And then lastly, modifying this word is the pronomial suffix who, which is translated as a possessive pronoun referring to Nebuchadnezzar. It's translated here correctly, his. Now the conjunction wa, uh, as I said before, in Greek New Testament, uh, we have the word ke, or uh, as Erasmus pronunciation, kai. So uh, though that word is used in different ways. It has different nuances. It can be used in an adjunctive sense. It can be used in an emphatic sense or merely as a copulative connecting phrases. Uh, and it could, do, it could be exegetical as well. Well, in the Hebrew, the conjunction wa is very much similar and just as, um, uh, just as uh, dynamic and just as uh, uh, you can do many things with it. It's very versatile is the word I'm looking for. So this conjunction wa, you'll see it a lot in the book of Daniel. We saw it a lot of course, in Jonah. Now, the conjunction wa here is used here as a marker of a sequence of closely related vent, events. So that means that this word is introducing here in verse 3 a clause that marks the next sequential event that took place after Nebuchadnezzar stored some of the articles of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem to be stored in the temple treasury of his god Marduk. So this word, is, which is translated correctly then, is telling us that the next sequential event that took place after Nebuchadnezzar took some of the uh, articles of silver and gold and bronze from Solomon's temple and brought them to his god, uh, into the, te the treasury of the temple of his god, Marduk, this word, conjunction war in verse 3, is telling us, is introducing a statement that's saying what's the next thing that took place chronologically. Now the word that's translated king there is malek. We saw this in previous classes. This word is correctly translated. It's, of course, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he was the governmental head of Babylon. Now, remember, we talked about him in the introduction. He's one of the great military commanders of the ancient world. He was a genius. He was a, a military genius. He was also a great statesman. He was a great... A lawgiver. His laws, we found out from in uh, archaeology, we've discovered that he was a great lawgiver and he was a great architect. A lot of the kings of the ancient world to leave monuments behind for themselves were actually great builders. Uh, king Herod was a great builder. Uh, so there was this individual, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, he was a great, great architect as well. So he could do a lot of different things. He was very brilliant, and he's going to do something very interesting here that Alexander the Great actually made really popular, is that he would take some of the, uh, the uh, citizens and higher echelons of society, uh, of, a, of a nation that he conquered, and he would use them in his own government. He would train them according to his language and, the, and, and laws, and then he would use them, and his, he'd take the best and brightest of the conquered nations and have them serve in his government. So this is what we got going on in this passage. So Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar here, uh, he, remember he has invaded 
at this particular time in Daniel, this is speaking of the first invasion that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the first attack of Jerusalem and Judah in 605 BC. Remember, 10, in 609, 690, 597 BC, he comes back and he takes Ezekiel as one of those captives. And then finally, he has to come back again because Zedekiah. Uh, who he uh, installed as a puppet king, uh, would not do what he was told to do, and so he rebelled, and so Nebuchadnezzar came back in 587 B.C. and launched the final attack against Jerusalem, which actually leveled the city and actually leveled the Temple of Solomon, destroyed it, and he took all of the articles uh, into into Babylon. In Daniel 1-2, we saw it's just a portion at this time in 605 B.C., only a portion of those articles in the Temple of Solomon were taken to Babylon. By the time he t destroyed the temple, of course, he had taken everything. He had uh, pillaged the place and taken everything out of the Temple of Solomon. So Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the man here. And he is uh, an individual we're going to see quite a bit. And we're going to see a lot of in uh, particular chapter 2. We're going to see uh, uh, him in chapter 3 and chapter 4. He ends up becoming a believer. He, beco he was an individual who was, very, like most great uh, military commanders and conquerors, he was so arrogant and so full of himself. And, uh, but we see that by the time we get to chapter 4, he has uh, been humbled by God. And he believes in the God and, and, and acknowledges the God of Israel as sovereign over himself and his nation and the nations of the world. So Nebuchadnezzar is quite an individual in the ancient world. Now, the word that's translated here, ordered, is the word amar, it's translated here, ordered, or you can translate it, command. And the reason why it should be translated that way is because obviously the statement to follow records Nebuchadnezzar ordering the chief of his court officials, Ashpenaz, to bring in certain Israelites who were no of noble and royal descent in order to train them to serve in his royal court. Now, as part of the tribute that Nebuchadnezzar would require of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, would be that Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, would have to provide him Israelite nobles and those of royal descent to serve in his government. So this is a common thing to do when you conquered a nation. The conqueror would require you to take some of the, the best and the brightest from your nation to serve in his government. Now, the king of Babylon would enlist, as we saw in verse 4, he would enlist handsome, young, well-educated young princes from a conquered country like Israel, and he would train them in the Babylonian language and literature. It's quite a, it's a very brilliant, smart thing to do to do that, is to take because if you don't do that, they'll conspire against you. So uh, one of the things that happens if he doesn't take some of these young uh, princes with him, they're going to end up and he leaves them there without destroying the city. Like he wants to make he wants to make it a vassal. Uh, that, that particular city, well, then they can come back to bite you and rebel against you, and then you have to come out again. So uh, here he's thinking, I'll take some of the, the best and the brightest, the young princes, and I'll, bring, I'll get them Babylonianized. I'll, get them, I'll give them a, a great job with me, and they'll get everything they need, and they'll have everything provided for them, and yet they have to serve me, and that'll make them forget where they were if they got it good over here in Babylon. So this was a smart thing that Be King Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar was doing. So the, uh, we see here that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar would require uh, uh, Judah and Jehoiakim uh, to provide him, he would require that Jehoiakim provide him nobles and those of royal descent to serve in his government. So he would enlist, the king of Babylon would enlist young, well-educated young princes from a conquered country like Israel and train them in the Babylonian language and literature. And this would include the ancient Sumerian and Akkadian syllab uh, syllabic cuneiform as well as the Aramaic alphabetic system that was used in international communication. As I said before, Aramaic, which is the book of Daniel, from Daniel 2.4, the B part, the second statement in verse 4 of chapter 2, all the way to the end of chapter 7, is in Aramaic. The rest of the book is in Hebrew. And the Aramaic is the lingua franca of the day. It was the international language of the day. Like in Paul's day, Koine Greek was that. That was the, the lingua franca. franca. And uh, that wasn't the case in the 6th century B.C. when Daniel wrote this book, the book of Daniel. So we see here that they, these, these captives, these deportees, these young princes, and Daniel was among them. 
He would, in fact, he would, in Ezekiel, he was a, he was a, one, uh, in, a pre, in the priesthood in Israel. He was from that, uh, that uh, 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 branch of Israelite society. Daniel was a, a, a noble. He was of a noble descent. And him and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, Azariah and also Mishael, who had the names changed to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these individuals were all very talented individuals, very well educated, handsome. They were the best and the brightest, the youngest of the, the, the young talent that was coming up in Judean society. So we see here that the, uh, that the individual that we have here that is g- taking these orders from Nebuchadnezzar is a man named Ashpenaz. He is named here as the uh, of, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, a chief of his officials. So the, all the officials, the part of his cabinet, this man run, ran the show. He's basically like his chief of staff. So Ashpenaz had a great, important job. And we see here that we don't know, with Ashpenaz, his meaning of his name is uncertain, but that's really not important what the meaning of his name is. What we do know from the rest of the chapter one is he was a guy who was very uh, sympathetic to Daniel and his friends. So he was obviously some kind of, and, and the Lord put this in his heart. So evidently, this man had a lot of character and integrity. He was a very compassionate man. He could have been very tough with Daniel and the captives, but he showed himself to be very compassionate. And of course, the scriptures tell us that the Lord put this in his heart to be this way toward Daniel and his friends. So we do not know for sure the, the background of the chief of Nebuchadnezzar's court officials, Ashpenaz. This individual, as I said before, is identified by Daniel as the chief of Nebuchadnezzar's court officials, and he's mentioned uh, later on in chapter 1, in verses 7 through 11 and verse 18, but he's not mentioned by name. These passages, we'll see in a moment, indicate that this man, Ashpenaz, had compassion toward Daniel and his friends, and he permitted them, and he showed this by permitting them, to abstain from the king's food and wine and eat vegetables and drink water in order so that they could, Daniel and his friends could observe the dietary regulations of the Mosaic law. Now, go to Daniel, look at, uh, you're in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, look at that verse. It says in Daniel 1, 3, then king the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his, of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths or young men, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him, Nebuchadnezzar, ordering Ashpenaz, to teach these captives, these deportees, Daniel among them, the literature and language of the Chaldeans, i.e. the Babylonians. Then it says in verse 5, And the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. So Nebuchadnezzar has big plans for these guys. He wants them to be in good health. He wants them to eat the same food and drink the same fine wine as he does. Then it says, And he appointed that they should be educated, three years, and at the end of which time they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them, from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and then the commander of the officials, that would be uh, uh, Ashpenaz, assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael, Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Now, the reason why you do that, as we'll see in in, in next week, is to give them citizenship, but also to Babylonianize them. Now, look at verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, because it wasn't uh, the food that Nebuchadnezzar would be uh, eating would, and the wine, the wine would be offered up to his God, and also the food would not be kosher for Daniel. In other words, it would be unclean according to the dietary regulations of the Mosaic law. So if he wanted to keep the law and ceremonial, keep himself ceremonially clean under the Mosaic law, see, Daniel was under the law, not like us, so he would have to find a way so that he could avoid eating the king's food and drinking his wine. Now that's next to impossible. Almost, pretty much, but, God was working in this situation here, as we'll see, and he's going to work through Ashpenaz. So he said, so as it goes on to say, so Daniel sought permission from the commander of the officials, 
Ashpenaz, that he might not defile himself. Now watch what happens here. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. God caused Ashpenaz, the commander of Nebuchadnezzar's officials, to be sympathetic to Daniel. Now look at it, it says in verse 10. And the commander, Ashpenaz, of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who were your own age? Th then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. Now it looks like he's, not, he's uh, not sympathetic, but that's not the case. He is sympathetic. Ashpenaz just doesn't know uh, what he should do here. He wants to help Daniel out here. He likes Daniel. And however, the problem is he's got orders from his, from his king. Now, how is this going to take place? How is he going to be able to fulfill Daniel's request? Well, look what it goes on to say. It says in verse 11, But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Don't miss that. The overseer is the one that is sitting under Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz is under Nebuchadnezzar. And the next the chain of command is that under Ashpenaz is this overseer. Now, mind you, the overseer will not do anything unless he's got Ashpenaz's approval, all right? Because at stake is Ashpenaz's head. So the overseer is going to do whatever uh, that over whatever uh, Ashpenaz sees fit. So watch what happens next. Verse 12, here's Daniel's proposal. Please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. That way he can be ceremonially clean. Then let our... Uh, parents be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So if we look healthier and better than they do or equal, then, then we, it's all right because the whole purpose of Nebuchadnezzar putting them on his food and wine is to make them healthy, to make them look healthy like he was. So then it says in verse 14, so he listened to them. Now he couldn't, he, meaning obeyed, he, he uh, gave him his request to do this for 10 days, this 10-day trial period. What do, they, what do they have to lose? In fact, if they look better, which they probably seriously doubted, uh, what do they have to lose out of this? If it doesn't work out after 10 days, they stay on the king's food, right? So he's, there's really not a big high risk here. So it says in verse 14, he listened to them, he obeyed them, actually it says, and uh, or in the sense that he granted his request. And this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. It doesn't mean fatter, actually. It means that they looked healthier. Then it says in verse 16, So the overseer, who is under Ashpenaz, continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. So the overseer went back to Ashpenaz and Ashpenaz gave his approval. So as for these youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, and Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the 10 days, which the king had specified uh, for presenting them, excuse me, at the end of days, the three-year period, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials, Ashpenaz, presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. So in verse 3, we see an individual who's going to be a big player in this chapter. Early on in Daniel's uh, situation, circumstances in Babylon, Ashpenaz. He is a, obviously a very, wa in, a very compassionate individual. He didn't let his power over Daniel and his friends go to his head. He was reasonable. So this man uh, obviously was used by God to help Daniel and his friends maintain their obedience to the dietary regulations of the Mosaic law. Now go back to Daniel 1.3, please. Daniel 1.3. So it says in Daniel 1.3, the, Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Now the word that's translated chief there, that's the word rob, which is uh, translated correctly, it functions as a noun, and it refers to the individual who is the supreme authority over Nebuchadnezzar's officials, which is Ashpenaz. The word that's translated officials, saris, it appears 42 times in the Hebrew Bible, and it can refer either to a court official or to literal eunuchs. 
The word is regarded as a loan word from Akkadian, referring to a high-ranking court official. Now, in early biblical literature, this usually me seems to be the meaning. However, in later times, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians adopted the practice of castrating those who served in the royal palace and the harems. Consequently, the term can mean eunuch, that is, a castrated male, thus one who is sexually impotent. Now, the reason why they did this is that the kings did not want to risk a son of a servant being an heir to the throne. So if you were in the royal household and you were a male, they castrated you. And because they didn't want to have somebody preg impregnating one of his harem, one of his women or the queen or something like that. They took away all that chance of ever happening. And so, uh, and there are some people who believe that maybe Daniel was a eunuch. And for years, I thought he was, but I don't believe he was at all. And uh, I don't believe that at all. In fact, I don't think he, he lived in, the, in, the, in Nebuchadnezzar's residence or palace. I think he was out there in, in the different provinces or a different, uh, d had a different uh, residence. And the other reason why I don't think he, and we'll see this when we get to chapter, uh, verse 4, the other reason why I don't think Daniel was uh, castrated was if you look at verse 4, it says, youths or young men in whom was no defect. Now, being castrated would be a major defect. So obviously from that, I don't believe he was. I mean, you can disagree with me, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sit there and go, oh, you know, you know what you're talking about. I, but I, and because uh, historically, though, that's what they would do. The Babylonians the, um, and the uh, Persians and the Assyrians, they did that to male captives when they wanted them to come into their royal residence, so they would do that to them. So I don't believe Daniel was, but Ashpenaz definitely was. Now, Potiphar, remember we studied in the book of Genesis, he was also a court official for Pharaoh, and he, was, he had a wife, as we saw, who tried to commit adultery with, with Joseph. Now, it is clear that Potiphar was not a eunuch, meaning he was not a castrated male. And, th and the reason why that is is because he had a wife. Now, more than likely, this word saris, translated officials in Daniel's one, Daniel 1, 3, it means officials, but since the Babylonians adopted the practice of castrating those who served in the royal palace and the harems, Ashpenaz would have been a eunuch himself, that is, a castrated male, thus one who is sexually impotent, meaning he cannot impregnate a woman, a woman because now he no longer has uh, the sexual apparatus. Now look at Daniel 1.3. He says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. To bring in some of the sons of Israel is, starts off, it's a prepositional phrase composed of the preposition lamed, and then its object is the hifel, infinitive construct form of the verb bo, which is translated here, bring in. And then it's followed by another preposition. The preposition men, translated some of, and its object is the word bane, which is translated sons. And then we have that great word, Yisrael, and that's translated Israel. We saw that in the book of Genesis. We've seen it in the book of Exodus as well. Uh, keep it down over there. Now, the verb bo there, it's translated to bring in, is the, in the hifal stem, as I said before. And it means to transport. transport. So what De uh, Nebuchadnezzar is telling Ashpenaz to do is I want you to, when he says bring in, he means to transport some of these nobles, young men who are nobles and members of the royal family, bring them in in the sense of transporting them Take the 900-mile journey from Judea, Jerusalem, all the way uh, north into Syria, down the Euphrates River, into Babylon itself, and southern, what is now known today as southern Iraq. Make that 900-mile trek uh, back, transport these individuals to my place, uh, my, uh, in, into, uh, into Babylon. So this word, Bo, denotes deporting these Israelites to Babylon. Now the word for sons, the word Bane, it not only designates people who are descended racially or biologically from Israel, but also emphasizes their national identity. Now, the preposition men is used in a partitive sense to denote the whole from which a part is taken. What does that mean? Well, it indicates that these two words denote that Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz to select only a part or a portion of the Israelites to be trained to serve in his government. So Nebuchadnezzar is not asking for every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Susie Q, okay? He only wants people in Israel who are high in status uh, uh, because they're the most educated. He doesn't want the poor. 
fact, Nebuchadnezzar, leave, when he destroys Jerusalem and the temple, he leaves the poor in the land. They're, ed- they're not educated. They're not going to be any use to him. He wanted people who were very well educated, who, uh, who had uh, a lot of uh, knowledge in different areas, and they were individuals who were of noble and royal descent. He wanted those kind of people. So the preposition men, when it's translated some of, that's saying I only want to, Nebuchadnezzar only wanted a portion of these Israelites. The great word for Israel, y- Yisrael, that word is, actually means one who fights and overcomes with the power of God. That's what that w- name means. Because according to Genesis 32, 28, the Lord gave Jacob this name because he fought with both God and man and prevailed. He overcame. Now this name was bestowed upon Jacob and constituted the essence of the blessing that he requested from the Lord in Genesis 32, 26. And the expression sons of Israel, which we have here in Daniel 1, 3, was first used in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis 32, 32. Now most of the time, In the Old Testament, the designation, the sons of Israel, emphasizes the Jewish people's national identity of Israel, Jacob's, uh, slash Jacob's sons or descendants. So this was a great noble word. Uh, Sometimes you see uh, the Jewish people are called Hebrews. That's the term that's used by foreigners in relation to them. This word, Israel, uh, talks about the fact that they are members of a theocracy, the Jewish people. So this designation speaks of the fact that the Jew is a member of a theocracy, hey Jody, is a member of a theocracy and is the heir of the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was later changed by the Lord to Israel. So this phrase, sons of Israel, the word Israel in particular, it expresses the dignity and glory of, of a member of the theocratic nation in a unique covenant relation with God, and it was the Jews' special badge and title of honor. It was something they were proud of because the name Israel meant that they were the covenant people of God. They were a special people given special promises and had a special relationship to God. And this was something they were very, very proud of. So remember, uh, Abraham, the father of the Jews, basically, he's the first Jew through circumcision. He's the progenitor of the nation of Israel. From him, he had a son. He had a son named Isaac. He had in his old age. His birth was a miracle. And Isaac had his two boys, Esau and Jacob. Jacob was the one who became the believer. Esau did not believe. But more than that, Jacob was the one who who was going to receive, have these covenant promises that were given to Abraham and Isaac, his father, those covenant promises given to his father and his grandfather would be given to him, and actually God would enlarge upon these promises, this Abrahamic covenant. He would reiterate, I'm going to give your descendants land. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to do this for you. You, you, I'm going to make your descendants as as innumerable as the sand on the seashore. So Jacob was a, a man who started off bad in life, but he became a great man of God, and we, uh, and uh, he became a great man of God, and when he really, uh, really started to advance spiritually, he had his name changed. He had his name changed by God from Jacob, and Jacob means supplanter, meaning he was a he was a guy who was you couldn't trust. He was deceitful, and he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, meaning the. Israel, the one who overcomes, the one who fights and overcomes with the power of God. Basically, his name kind of describes the spiritual life. We are should be individuals who are individuals who fight sin and Satan, but do it so with God's power, and uh, which is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ, our union with Him. So this word Israel is very when he calls it says when it says in verse three in Daniel one three, and it says. uh, and then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. The word Israel is used here by Daniel because he's emphasizing that these young nobles and members of the royal family were members of a theocracy. They were aware of this. They were aware of this. It doesn't say the Jews or the Hebrews. It's Daniel's view of himself and the view of his friends, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Ashpenaz. Uh, excuse me, uh, Azariah. It was their view of themselves. They, they were aware and proud of the fact that they were believers in the God of Israel 
the, the, the creator, and they were members of his theocratic nation, Israel. So this word, the term Israelites, as well as its cognate noun, Israel, denotes the Jews' theocratic privileges and glorious vocation. It was a very proud designation for themselves. Now, Daniel in Daniel 1.3, this name Israel, Israelites, or Israel, excuse me, speaks of the fact that the Jew is a member of a theocracy. Now, our nation is not a theocracy. This is why I try to tell people, you know, the, the United States is not a Christian nation. Uh, I don't know why people think it, it is. Do we have Judeo-Christian background? Absolutely. But we would, no place in the Word of God or anywhere has God said, this is my nation. See, the nation that's called my nation, which Israel is called, that's a theocracy. Okay? The United States is not a theocracy. In fact, most of the people in this country now are not believers in Jesus Christ. They're not Christians. Are there a lot of Christians in this country? Yes. But that doesn't mean we're a theocracy. See, if we were a theocracy, we would have the things that Israel was given. You know, there were certain ways they were supposed to act. They couldn't eat certain foods. They had certain identifying, distinguishing marks uh, from the rest of the world. Circumcision, the dietary regulations of the law, the covenants, the, uh, the, the temple worship, the tabernacle worship. Have we ever received stuff like that? No. We don't have that privilege. That's given to Israel. There's only one theocracy in history, and there'll only be one, and that is Israel. That's the fact, and for people to sit, sit there and say in this country that we're a Christian nation, in what sense are we a Christian nation? Majority people in this country are not even Christian anymore. Did we start off as, with a, people who were believers? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and they did a lot of things in this country to start this country off, the founding fathers, with basically things that they learned from their Bible, and they try to pr put these things into practice. But God is the one who says that a nation is a theocracy, meaning a theocracy means a nation that's run by God. It's governed by God personally. Now, in the millennial reign, the whole earth is going to be basically a, a, a theocratic, run by a theocratic government, meaning Jesus Christ is going to run the earth. His government will be running the entire earth. That's not happened yet. So we see here that the word Israel in Daniel 1.3, it speaks of the fact that the Jew is a member of a theocracy. It identifies them people. As a, as a unique, privileged, covenant people of God, heir the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, who, and remember, Jacob had his name changed by God to Israel. Now look at Daniel 1.5 as we come near the end here. Daniel, uh, excuse me, Daniel 1.3. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. And then it says, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. That phrase, including some of the royal family and some of the nobles, is telling us Daniel's background, social background. Because later on in the verse, later on in, the, in, in verse, what is it, verse uh, 6 there? In verse 6, it says, now amongst, among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So there we have it. Those four men, those four young men, they were about 17, 18 years old. They weren't little kids. We'll find out that's not, they're not little kids. They're 17, 18 years old. And here they are, and, and they're from a background where they were very privileged. They were not poor. They were very wealthy. They came from the upper echelons of society. They were high class. They weren't middle class. They were way up there. They had money. They had status. Uh, they, they were, they had, they dated all the, the pretty girls and the, you know, Daniel, Hannah, and I, those guys, they, they came from a privileged background. So the phrase, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, is composed, first of all, the conjunction wa. It's translated here correctly, including. And then we have the preposition min again, translated some of again. And then its object is the word zera, which is translated family. And it's modifying the articular form of the noun, maluka, which is translated here, royal. And then we have the conjunction war again, translated in. And then it's introducing the phrase of the nobles. And the, of the, uh, the, uh, the phrase of the nobles is composed of the preposition men. And the word for nobles is part tam, or we could say partamim. And that word is speaking of the nobles in Israel. And now the conjunction wa, translated uh, including, 
It's used in an ep- uh, uh, explicative sense, meaning that the clause is introducing a statement which clarifies or specifies which members of the sons of Israel that Nebuchadnezzar ordered his officials chief, Ashpenaz, to transport to Babylon to be trained to serve in a governmental capacity. Now the word for family there, it refers to an extended family based on a common ancestor. Here it refers to those Israelites who were descendants of the kings of Israel and Judah. So Daniel and Azariah, Mishael and Hananiah, those four boys, those four young men, they were individuals who were from, uh, no, they're from nobility. We would call them in, in England, what they call them, blue bloods. That's the kind of kid he, what these guys were. So the word maluka, uh, translated royal here, it's modifying the noun zara, translated family, and together these two words mean royal family. And then we have the word partam, and it's in the, uh, the plural form, so it's partamim. It's a Persian loan word, and it means nobles here. It refers to those persons in Israel who were, soci- who were associated with a ruling class or royal family. So the royal family means that you are related to the king of Judah. Now, the nobles means that you are connected to people in the ruling class. Like, for instance, Daniel, we don't know too much about Daniel's parents, but, or Han and I or these other guys, their, their parents, but maybe the father will want to, because they were nobles, the father served in, in some, some, offici- uh, some official capacity in Jehoiakim's government. He worked for the king somehow. He served the king. Or he was a very wealthy individual. Maybe uh, Daniel and his three friends, maybe their father was a noble because he was a very powerful man financially uh, in in that sense. So he had a big influence on society because he came from money. Either one of those things could have taken place. The scriptures don't, uh, Daniel doesn't give us too much more information, only to tell us that he came from uh, the upper echelons of Judean society. Now, in Daniel 1.4, that verse makes clear that Nebuchadnezzar's purpose in deporting some of the royal family and some of the nobles of Judah was to train them to serve in an administrative capacity in his government. Look at Daniel 1.3 uh, again. Daniel 1.3 says, Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Youths, or as we'll see, young men, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of, wis- branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. Now that's telling us that Daniel and his three companions were very talented. They were good-looking, because they couldn't get selected unless they met these qualifications. We know Daniel was good-looking in his friends. We know that they were very intelligent. We know that they, had, they were knowledgeable. And every branch of wisdom, which we're going to see, involved astronomy, astrology, mathematics, history, languages. They were brilliant. Okay, They were very well-educated. Discerning and knowledge. And they had the ability to serve in the king's court. They're descri- that's describing for us Daniel and his three companions. How do we know that? Because Daniel and his three companions would not have been selected to choose to serve uh, to train for three years in the Babylonian for the plan, for the to serve in the Babylonian court unless they could meet these qualifications. So it's telling us, verse four, something about Daniel and his three companions. But it's interesting, and we'll develop this next week. Nebuchadnezzar is not looking at these men and their character; he's looking at them according to their their talents, their intelligence. However, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have godly standards, of course. See, when God, God uh, uh, was, pl- uh, Daniel and his three companions were uh, pleasing to God because of their godly character. Not because they were intelligent, not because they were wealthy, but because they had godly character. In other words, they were obedient to him. They obeyed his word, they were students of the word, and they obeyed the word, even in the midst of a foreign country and a heathen nation where the king could execute them at any time for standing up and trying to obey the, the dietary regulations of the law and, and saying no to the food of Nebuchadnezzar in his court. So there was a, these men had a lot of moral courage. So Nebuchadnezzar, 
He wants people who have intelligence, are good looking. Isn't that what our country does? We choose leaders not because of their character, but because of their physical appearance and because of their intelligence. There are a lot of people who are very intelligent in our government, but they have no character. They have no norms and standards. There's no, they don't live by any absolutes. They don't know that there's right and there's wrong. There's evil and there's, uh, there's good. There's things that are, they don't, they don't make those, that, that to them, they don't live in that world. They live according to the standards of Satan's cosmic system. So just because you're intelligent doesn't mean that you're, you're successful in God's eyes. It may be in the king's eyes or Nebuchad, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, Daniel and his friends were talented, but uh, they, were, they were something uh, that, that were um, going to be uh, impressive to Nebuchadnezzar. But to God, God didn't measure Daniel and his friends nor does he measure any of his people or members of the, of the world by these standards, okay? So there's a big difference. Nebuchadnezzar is looking at the overt, not what, not the godly character within, which manifests, manifests itself in your conduct. So that's very interesting here, what we got going on. So the poor, whole purpose, Daniel, well, Daniel 1, 4 goes on to say, after the, 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 listening to the qualifications, and he, Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, his uh, officials commander, to teach them, these young deportees, the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And look at it says in verse 5, and the king appointed them for a daily ration from his choice food and from the wine which he drank, and he appointed that they should be educated three years, and it was a very arduous uh, 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 a uh, very arduous education in the Babylonian language and literature. And at the, look what it says, at the end of which time they were to enter the king's personal service. That means they would be dignitaries, meaning they would have official position in Nebuchadnezzar's government. One of the reasons why they changed their names is because they couldn't, they couldn't serve in Nebuchadnezzar's per, uh, personal uh, service unless they were Babylonian citizens themselves. So changing their names, giving them names, was basically giving them Babylonian citizenship so that they could serve in, in Nebuchadnezzar's govern, government. So this is a big, this is a, you know, this is a great opportunity in a way. I mean, you couldn't have it any better. Your, your country's been, uh, your country's been captured, conquered by another nation, and now the nation's leader wants to give you uh, the best food, his food, the best wine, give you a great education, and you know, give you all that the world, the best the world could give you to serve in his government and give you a great position. So I mean, this is this is a great opportunity. However, there are pitfalls because if you're a godly person like Daniel and his three friends are, this gives you a big problem. Now, how do you maintain the biblical standards, the godly standards that God wants you to live by, his standards? How do you do that in the midst of a heathen nation? That's what I say. Daniel is much more than the book, the prophecy. It's about godly character, living in the midst of a heathen world. What a great book that we can learn, for, learn from Daniel and his friends on how to live and how to have moral courage and stand up for God in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. This is a great, great, great example that Daniel gives us. Now, the fact that Nebuchadnezzar deported some of the nobles and members of the royal family to Babylon was a fulfillment of prophecy because Isaiah predicted to King Hezekiah that this would happen to his descendants. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 18, and a passage in Isaiah 36, 5, uh, 39, uh, verses 5 through 7, those passages parallel each other. They speak of the same event. Hezekiah was told by Isaiah that his descendants would be taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar and be made to serve in his government. And it's interesting why that took place. So go, one more passage, go to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. Red Bull. <laughs> Poor Jody. 
All right, look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. Look at verse 1. Now, the, the fact that Daniel, again, the fact that Daniel and the rest of these uh, nobility and the ro- members of the royal family were deported into Babylon was predicted. Uh, Isaiah told Hezekiah that his descendants, I mean, he's King Hezekiah, his descendants, his grandchildren, great grandchildren, they'd be taken into Babylon. And it was because, it's interesting, there are a lot, we're finding out there was a lot of reasons why Judah was deported to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that they didn't keep the sab- Sabbath years, the, sabbatic, uh, the, sa- the rest for the land. We've seen also that uh, Je- Jehoiakim was a wicked king, did, committed, assassinated a prophet of God. We saw there were several different reasons why God deported these people. Now we're going to see another one. King Hezekiah did something stupid. He did something stupid, and, he, he, and God and you said, okay, this is what's going to happen because of what you did. Now look at 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face, Hezekiah did, to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord... I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He was a great king. He loved God. He did some great things for the Lord. And in Israel, he was a good leader. He was a good king, one of the few. Before Isaiah had gone out from the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of your father, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my, uh, my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Hezekiah reco- recovered. Now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This shall be the sign to you from the Lord, and the Lord will, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or go back ten steps? So, of course not. Have you ever seen your shadow go back ten steps? If you have, tell me, and I will we'll take you to the doctor. Okay, it doesn't go 10 steps for, like you're looking at your shadow. Does your shadow go walking up 10 steps up the stairs or does it go backward? That's what he's saying. It doesn't happen because for that to happen, there's something wrong here, right? You're, you're something, something wrong with you, right? But well, God's going to do something here. So Hezekiah answered in verse 10, it is easy for the shadow to decline 10 steps. No, but let the shadow turn, ten, ten ba- turn backward 10 steps. And I, meaning basically what he's saying, this is what he's telling the sun is going to move back, okay? It's going to move so the shadow goes back. Not, not like it usually the, the progression is the sh- as the sun goes down, the shadow will go, you know, fall forward. So he says, Isaiah, the, this is, Isaiah verse 11 says, Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord and he brought the shadow on the stairway back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So there we have in verse 12 now, look what happens. He lets him live 15 more years, right? Well, he gets himself into trouble. At that time, verse 12, uh, it says that uh, Beroda uh, Baluktan, excuse me, Beroda Baluktan, uh, that's uh, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. Okay, he's the king of Babylon. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasure treasure house the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil in the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries there was nothing in his house nor all his dominion that hezekiah did not show them it's arrogance why would you show a foreign nation what you got look at verse 14 then isaiah the prophet came to king hezekiah and said to him what do these men say and from where have they come to you and hezekiah said they have come from a far country from babylon 
he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered and said, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons, he's a king, right? Remember the royal family? Some of the royal family in Daniel 1.3 was taken into captivity, Babylon. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, and sons meaning, it can mean not just your direct, uh, your, your, your son's son, but your grandsons. It could be used that way too, and great-grandsons. So some of your sons, your descendants, who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So basically, when Daniel says that some of the royal family and the nobles were taken into Babylon, they were the royal family, those were individuals who descended from King Hezekiah. And why did that take place? Because King Hezekiah did something really stupid. He allowed the officials from Babylon to see his treasuries, which God did not want to take place. Verse 19 then Hezekiah, I love what he says here. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord, which you have spoken is good. For he thought, is it not so if there will be peace and truth in my days? Basically, oh, it's going to be nice in my day. <laughs> what do I care if this happens after I'm dead? Now look at, verse, then it says in verse 20, now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, became king in his place. And he was uh, an, a, a weird individual. He was a wicked, evil king. Well, there we have it. Daniel, when he, it says in Daniel 1.3 that some of the nobles and the royal family, were some of the young men from the nobles and the royal family were taken into Babylon. That was a fulfillment of prophecy, a prophecy that Isaiah issued to, the, to King Hezekiah. So let's close in prayer. And remember, tomorrow we have no... Uh, no class. We'll resume classes on Sunday, 9 a.m. We're going to be doing the book of Exodus as we continue with that study. We're going to study the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up Daniel next Tuesday. Remember, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, all the people in Pal Talk. Happy Thanksgiving. I'll see you guys tomorrow. And uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving to the Fletchers, Pixie, uh, Alice, and George, whoever's on there tonight. Um, uh, happy Thanksgiving. And uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with the things that we've heard, help educate us and help us to make uh, right decisions following the example of Daniel. And uh, we just uh, thank you again for your word, another week of Bible doctrine. And we just pray that this class would bring glory to you and your son and, bring, and minister to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.